Hello, Leafs Nation. It's uh, it's been a minute since um, I did my last podcast. Um, this isn't something I do uh, to make money or um, it's not really like a side hustle or anything like that. So unfortunately, sometimes uh, life gets in the way and things get busy. And um, so, yeah, it's it's been a couple of weeks since my last podcast, but uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, in Leafs Nation. Um, to start this episode, I want to just rewind a little bit before the All-Star break and um, talk about a little stretch of hockey where the Leafs were actually pretty good despite everything that's going on uh, before the break. Um, the Leafs uh, played Calgary. They won 4-3. They played Vancouver. They lost 6-4, which to me, you know, outside of the first 10 to 15 minutes of the first period, the Leafs absolutely dominated that game. Like, you know, everybody says, you know, Vancouver's so good and they're one of the best teams in the NHL. When the Leafs turned it on, they had absolutely no response. And when you're watching the game on TV, you're watching Quinn Hughes, you know, skate to the bench, slam a stick, break a stick, throw water bottles. Like, they had no answer for the Leafs when the Leafs turned it on and were playing good. Unfortunately, you know, in the third period, there were some, you know, penalty calls that I thought were real suspect, but it is what it is. Um, The Leafs didn't end up winning that game. Same old story. Third period comes around. The Leafs can't get a whistle. Can't get a penalty, but the other team always gets a penalty in the third period to give them a chance to win the game or tie it up or do something. It's it's ridiculous, you know. Uh, we'll we'll talk about it, you know, in in depth more in this episode. But you know, you're watching the game on TV and you're watching the guys covering the game saying. You know, it's been a while since the Leafs got a whistle. It's been a while since the Leafs got a penalty. They're they're in a real drought right now, and it's absolutely the case. You know, we'll talk about it, but last game, McCabe gets hit into the boards from behind. It's not boarding. But Jamie comes in and hits the guy with the puck, and it's interference. Like, it's, it, it's so beyond ridiculous what's going on in the NHL right now. Officiating is 1,000%, 1,000% trash. And we'll get into the Morgan Riley suspension and things like that. But, you know, Jake McCabe is bleeding from his nose on a, on a, on a, on a game-to-game basis, daily basis. This guy is leaking from his face. March, uh, what's it called? Marchman in Dallas doesn't get a penalty, even though he the puck was clearly gone. And and but we're gonna talk about it. The Leafs are starting to carve out a, an identity for themselves, and we're definitely gonna talk about that. But let's go back to the stretch before the All Star game. So the Leafs beat Calgary, very good against um, the Canucks. They barely had sh- had shots in that game. The Canucks were, you know, very lucky um, to win that game. And then the Leafs beat Seattle 3-1. They beat Winnipeg in Toronto in overtime. uh, 1-0. I was actually at that game. Leafs were amazing in that game. Defensively sound. Uh, Samsonov was good. By the way, Samsonov is back. All the Samsonov haters can just, you know, they know exactly where they can go. Samsonov had a bad stretch, yes, but he's not Jack Campbell. This guy actually has skill. This guy actually has pedigree. This guy has been playing amazing since his little stint where they sent him away. He got time to clear his head. Since he's come back, he's been He's been a very good NHL goalie, um, just like he was last year for the Leafs, where he carried the team. And 
you know, Samsonov is back, and thank God for that. I was I was really hoping that he would. Uh, I, I knew in the back of my head that he was going to figure it out. Um, but right now, you know, Joseph Wall is still far away from coming back. Martin Jones just sustained an injury. Um, Hildeby is backing up, and you know, the Leafs need Samsonov, and Samsonov has been good. So, going back to the stretch before the All Star game, so the Leafs beat Calgary. They should have beat Vancouver. They beat Seattle. One nothing against uh, uh, Winnipeg Jets, who are supposed to be another amazing team in the NHL that the Leafs absolutely dominated. And then they go to Winnipeg, and then they beat Winnipeg four two to go into the All Star break. So that's that. Though that's a stretch of games that's very recent that Leafs fans can look at and say. Um, you know, it's it's the scenario isn't the sky is falling. Yes, the Leafs have been inconsistent this season, but they have 100% have the talent. They have the coaching, and now they have the goaltending. And uh, I think they're just going to continue to continue to trend upwards, and uh, they're going to trend towards uh you know good old safe hockey and score goals where they need to because they have tons of guys that can score goals and um you know the ramp up to the playoffs which uh you know there's only 31 games left in the season so things are things are gonna get crazy fast so there's a stretch of games leafs were absolutely amazing it's five games before the all-star break where the Leafs played so good, they went into the uh, All-Star break on a high. And then the All-Star game as a whole, uh, being that I live in Toronto, I got I went down to the uh, NHL fanfare, took a picture with the Stanley Cup. The, all the trophies were there, uh, you know, Conn Smythe and, and uh, you know, uh, the East and West Trophy and the Selkie and the Rocket Richard and, you know, Vesna. All the, all the trophies were there, which was really cool. Um, definitely took some pictures, got to enjoy that. Um, Doug Gilmore was down there. Um, Matt Sundin was down there. Um, pretty cool event. A lot, lot, of, lot of cool things for the kids to uh, take part in and enjoy. They had tons of games set up, um, you know, Metro Toronto Convention Center. It was a, and the tickets weren't crazy expensive. So uh, well done there. And then there was the actual events itself. Like, and I have to say, like, I usually don't enjoy the all-star game and the skills competitions. Um, it's... They needed a change. They definitely needed to change things up, and I'm glad that they did it this year. It's different, right? Like, <clears throat> when you have an all-star game in Florida and they're on the beach and they're shooting pucks and they're doing stuff like that, it's just, it's, it's, it's okay to go into those markets and do stuff like that. But when you're in Toronto, it's, like, when you're in Toronto, this is, this is hockey mecca, right? You got to be a little bit more red carpet. You got to be a little bit more, you know, hockey and not so much gimmick. And they did a really great job. Like, uh, you know, I watched uh, the skills competition and I actually really liked the format. You had a bunch of players that were competing against each other from start to finish and you know all of a sudden you're like oh you know if i don't get good points in this event or if i don't win this event i'm going to get eliminated so it kind of raised things a little bit and the leaps had two players taking part in the skills and um it was actually like overall it was a really good showing from the leaps uh william nylander won an event um Austin Matthews should have won accuracy. Um, I don't want to, you know, this, it, it's not like a conspiracy theory or anything like that. It, it, I was watching it live. And when he hits the fourth target, 
Um, I noticed that the clock ran a little bit. So, you know, obviously I PVR'd it. And so I just, I, I, re, I rewound to the point where he hits the target. And then I press play and his time is 8.9. But they let it run to like 9 point something and uh, McDavid won. And I was actually surprised at how long it took him to stop the clock. Like Matthews easily beat McDavid in the accuracy shooting. But it is what it is. It's just it's a it's an all star thing. It's not really that big of a deal. I just I, I noticed that and then I watched it back just to I'm like why they let the clock run? It was it was weird. You guys can go check it out for yourselves. Um, but yeah, so Matthew showed well in the accuracy. He said all along that that was going to be his event. Um, Willie didn't do all that bad in accuracy actually. And uh, then there was the breakaway and the Leafs. Both Leafs did really well. So overall, the skills was actually really fun to watch. I was actually like, I, I had buddies over in the basement and um, like we found ourselves like at the edge of our seat sometimes and like rooting, you know, like we were yelling at the TV, like, come on, you know, score this goal. And like, I've never done that for a skills competition before in my life. It actually got me pretty engaged. And um, that hasn't happened in a long, long time. So I really like the format. It's it's way different than uh, stuff that they've done before. And great, like work on that format. It, it worked to me. It was very entertaining. And uh, from what I've seen on social media, a lot of people liked it too. So that's a format that people seem to like. And it works, which is great. Now, you know, if if uh, if, if, they, if they don't find anything to tweak about it to make it better, that's fine. Keep it the way it is, but don't change it from what it is right now. Right now, you have a format that, that worked, and it was kind of cool. So stick with that, and then maybe just tweak it down the road based on the market that it's in next year. And, you know, maybe do something specific to the market. But in in, in general, it was good. And then there was the all-star game itself and again i have my buddies over we're in the basement we're watching it and um you know like again we were on the edge of our seat and we were rooting because it's like uh the first game between um the two the two teams uh, mcdavid and and mcdavid's team and i think it was nathan mckinnon's team but it was like seconds left and they took the goalie out and then all of a sudden they scored and then they tied it up and then it went to a shootout. It goes straight to shootout, no overtime, which was cool. And, uh, you know, like I was, I, I was engaged. I was like, you know, me and my buddies were all, we were all very engaged. And then the Matthews team came on and, and they showed well, and then they eventually ended up, you know, beating McDavid's team, which was great. Like we were, we were rooting hard at the edge of our seats. We were, you know, we were raising our voice. We're like, come on! And then you see, you know, uh, Matthews uh, scored that one timer going down with I think it was Barzell, and he just rips it over Hellebuck's shoulder on that one timer, and it like we were jumping up and down like it was a Leafs game and they scored an overtime or something like it. I thoroughly entertained by the all-star game. It was a good format. I really liked it. Um, they really do can do better with the draft. I like the draft, but they need to, they need to be, a, I don't know. It, it felt scripted just because, you know, you pick, you know, Matthew Barzal and all of a sudden his jersey with his name is already on it like their jersey is waiting for it like I don't know if they did the picks in advance or whatever but like it didn't feel like it was like it was a live thing but it's not bad um you don't necessarily need the celebrities just let the hockey guys be on stage and you know joke around and have some fun with it and I like the player draft. It was cool. Overall, Toronto did really well. Like there were so many events uh, going on 
in and around the city with um you know celebrity ball hockey and mlsc launch pad and um and uh, you know uh, alumni games and things like that it was just the city was buzzing everybody was out you know nothing was crazy expensive um you know like i think it was 48 or 50 bucks to go to the player draft uh canadian and then um the fanfare was like 28 bucks or something like that like it, it wasn't nothing was crazy expensive um so even the jerseys even the all-star jerseys that they were selling online for 320 dollars when you went to the actual fanfare they were selling for i think like 250 or 260 so uh, even even those jerseys were brought down in price so um yeah nothing crazy they were they weren't gouging people they they really let people um enjoy uh you know seeing guys like doug gilmore and, and, and matt sundin and have them talk ask them questions do autograph things like that like overall i think toronto did a really good job and the leafs did a really good job uh overall with the all-star weekend and you know no complaints even though it was, there was a lot going on, the traffic wasn't crazy. Like I said, I drove down to the fanfare. There was no traffic. Drove back, no traffic. Like it, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, the tickets to the actual events, like Skills and, and All Star, tickets weren't crazy expensive. Like you can get into the building, in and around two hundred, three hundred. Uh, so it wasn't too bad. Uh. Post All Star break, a lot going on, a lot going on. Like, oh my god! So like, pre All Star, Leafs could have easily been on a five game winning streak. They played well. Um, and then post All Star, the Leafs have um. Like they lose to the Islanders, they beat Dallas, they lose to Ottawa, and it seems like you know there's a lot of up and down there, and then you start seeing Timmins has mononucleosis, mono, uh, which is he's done for the season at at this point, um, and then Marner misses a game, Tavares misses a game, Nylander just missed practice. Uh, watching Matthews play against St. Louis, he didn't look like himself. And there's definitely something going through the dressing room right now. And, you know, the energy levels are dipping and play is all over the place. But in general, I thought, I thought they were good against Dallas. Um, and then against... The Ottawa Senators, I thought they really just shot themselves in the foot. You know, like, Ottawa Senators suck. They're garbage as a franchise from top to bottom. They celebrate players that dive. They celebrate players that, you know, do stupid things like take a slap shot into an empty net. Yes, 100% it's a problem. Everybody, Everybody's online making jokes like, oh, you hurt my feelings. And, you know, just because it's a slap shot, 100%. If you go look at uh, um, Braden Shen in, in, in St. Louis, just did an interview in Toronto a couple of days ago, and he said 100% Morgan Riley's reaction was correct. Uh, I would have done the same thing as captain of the St. Louis Blues if, if somebody takes a slap shot into my net. In that. Uh, Jay Rose Hill retired enforcer in the nhl said 100 percent. that's the proper reaction to that play right so everybody around the nhl has retired players and current players are saying 100 percent. that is the proper reaction when somebody does something like that but in ottawa their team is second last in the eastern conference garbage they, they paid everybody vast sums of money on eight-year contracts and they they are going to suck for as long as those guys are around why because if you look at my feed on twitter 13 leap 01 tml domain 
uh, at 13 leaf zero one is the is the Twitter handle uh, or you could just search TML domain and you'll see on my feed I post every single time an Ottawa Senators player has performed the dive on the ice and coaches are furious um, Sheldon Keefe uh, in that game uh, called Stutzla one of the biggest divers he's yelling at the ref and if you look at his mouth He's you you actually he says it slow enough where you could actually read the lips and he says that's the worst diver in the NHL. And that's not the first time someone said somebody said something like that about an Ottawa Senators player. I've I've watched other Ottawa Senators games. I try to watch as many as I can. And there are coaches behind the other team's bench yelling that that's a dive. They're motioning dive and they're yelling dive. And that's and then just the other day, Reedley Greg who's supposed to be an agitator, I, you know, I model my game uh, after Brad Marchand is what he says. Guess what he does? Uh, he's skating by a guy, his, his, the other player's stick is, you know, horizontal to his body. And as he skates by, the stick makes contact and he holds it and then he falls. I've posted it on my feed, you can go watch the video. It's a dive. They dive nonstop. So what happens? Uh, Boone Jenner takes out Ridley, Ridley Gregg in the game. They're starting to get hit. There's the the disrespect is spreading amongst other NHL teams. So when they play the Ottawa Senators, they're going to get hit and they're going to get completely disrespected on the ice because they have zero respect for everybody. You know, clapper in the net, diving all over the place. You know, it, you know, Brady Kachuk is it ha, has a carte blanche to do whatever he wants to do on the ice, whether it's fight not fight. But you know, mo pretty much everybody on the Auto Center is just turtles. If you look at Ridley Gregg, as soon as Morgan Riley touches him, he grabs his head and he goes straight down to the ice. He knows that there's going to be a pile up. He knows that there's going to be a fight, and he knows there's going to be an altercation. But if he holds his head and falls down and looks hurt, the referees won't let anybody get to him. And then it looks worse on Morgan Riley because it looks like the player got hurt. But you, when he, in actuality, the guy was absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with him. But the hypocrisy from the people who cover the game is unreal. Craig Button, TSN Sports, not everybody. It's it's uh, sticks to the head are should not be a part of the game. Meanwhile, Jacob Truba two hands some guy in the back of the head and gets a two thousand dollar fine. The, on the same day, Morgan Riley got suspended for five games. Linus Allmark, uh, a player. Um, makes contact with him in the crease, and he takes his stick, and he hacks the guy in the back of the head, gets a $2,000 fine. So sticks to the head should absolutely not be a part of the game. Meanwhile, nobody gets suspended. Who's getting suspended other than David Perron? You know what I'm saying? Like, Austin Matthews cross-checked Darlene in the neck and got two games. Mark and Riley, for something as... Small as a push, got five games. You know why? Because it's Hockey Night in Canada. It's on national TV. It's the Toronto Maple Leafs. Guess what? Everybody had multiple hits on Morgan Riley. Sportsnet talked about it during other games. They're talking about Morgan Riley during the intermissions. They're talking about Morgan Riley. Morning show, afternoon show. Uh, evening radio show everyone's talking about morgan riley meanwhile linus allmark hacked the guy in the back of the head with his goalie stick in the crease and i would not have known about it unless i was following the account for player safety and they tweeted out that this player got fined for uh hitting a player in the head with a stick nobody talked about it there wasn't a hit on Sportsnet. There wasn't a hit on TSN. Craig Button was on television saying, sticks to the head are absolutely undefensible. You know what, Craig? 
How about you have that same energy for when other players do it? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. There is a tax in Toronto. If it's a two-game suspension, you're getting four. If it's a three-game suspension, you're getting five. There's a tax in Toronto. Player, since George Perros took over from Brendan Shanahan, the Leafs are the most suspended team in the NHL. Why? Because George Perros and the NHL are trying so hard to show everybody there's zero bias for Toronto and the NHL that they over-suspend. How are the Leafs a soft team? Everybody says the Leafs are soft, league-wide. Meanwhile, they're the most suspended team in the NHL for, for, for what kind of plays? Austin Matthews gets cross-checked in the spleen. No, he fell on his own. Jake McCabe gets run into the boards from behind. Flushing from his face. Matt Domi comes in, hits the guy with the puck. He gets an interference call. Meanwhile, when McCabe throws the puck off the boards, turns around, and Mason Marchman smashes him in the face, makes him leak again. It looked like he broke his nose. They say it was the visor, but who knows? That's not interference. So you get rid of the puck, you turn around, and the guy puts his shoulder in your face. That's not interference. But when Max Domi comes in and hits somebody with the puck, that's interference. It's unbelievable. There are three teams in the NHL that are only in the NHL because the Leafs put so much money into revenue sharing. The Leafs prop up Three NHL teams. Tell me what would happen if the Leafs got out of hockey tomorrow. The NHL will fold like a cheap suit. In baseball, the LA Dodgers, the New York Yankees are treated different. In basketball, the Lakers, the Warriors are treated different. Why shouldn't they be? They're your meal ticket. Why are the Leafs treated the way that they are in the NHL? Highest, re highest value amongst 32 NHL teams. Highest revenue amongst 32 teams. Propping up three NHL teams that can't make a lick of money. The one plays in a college stadium. And this is the way the Leafs get treated? Unbelievable. So anyways. Um, it's, it, it's crazy how, um, you know, you know, people make all sorts of jokes online. As soon as you hear uh, Tavares is out, Marner is out, Riley is out, well, Leafs are going to win tonight. But if they lose, they suck, right? So that's, that's Leafs Nation for you, right? They make jokes online about themselves and their team. And then when the expectation is not met, they suck, right? So... I look at a Leafs team that has, that has been dealing with adversity pretty much since day one of training camp, right? A defenseman that they brought in for all kinds of offense that was supposed to run power play number one in Klingberg re uh his hip injuries, which he got double hip surgery for, right? He, he pretty much didn't play all season. Yes, he played one game here and there, but at the end of the day, John Klingberg was supposed to be a piece. They lost him pretty much as of training camp. So there's a major piece that you spent four and a half million dollars on that didn't contribute anything. Tyler Bertuzzi hasn't scored much. Domi hasn't scored much. Not really contributing on the defensive end. 
right? If you if you look at the Leafs uh, Leafs last year in terms of their overall stats and underlying numbers, they were a great defensive team last year, and that's because of guys like Kerfoot and uh, you know all these things. And yeah, you want to make fun of Justin Hall. Yeah, you want to make fun of Kerfoot. But guess what? That team was a top five team in the NHL, and they ran the schedule. They ran through the schedule. Samsonov was another guy people want to make fun of is Samsonov. Samsonov destroyed the NHL last year and not and while he was hurt, beat the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round. But that that's Leafs Nation for you, right? Oh, everyone's out. We're gonna win tonight. Ha 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 ha. I don't understand where the like Leafs fans have zero respect for themselves and zero confidence, right? What's the point, right? Like, what's the point of being a Leaf fan if all you're going to do is make fun of yourself and your team? Where's your pride? Like, I'm a diehard Leafs fan. If they don't play well, I say, oh, well, they didn't play well. But I know in September that they're going to be in the playoffs. And I know no matter what happens, look at this season. Klingberg is hurt. Uh, uh, what's it called? All sorts of players are missing time due to illness, this and that. Look at that, Ty Domi, I mean, Ty Domi, Max Domi had one of his best games when Matthews was missing, was, was uh, missed a game earlier in the season. Uh, Samsonov wasn't playing well, Martin Jones. Uh, so at the beginning of, of the season, Will was playing really great, and we saw, you know, what his potential looks like. And then he gets hurt, Samsonov doesn't play well, Martin Jones comes in, plays excellent the Leafs have had all sorts of defensive problems and defensive injuries Lilligren got hurt um Connor Timmons has been hurt pretty much all this season he hasn't played much um and and Leafs are sticky game guys like Benoit from the AHL Lagasin Lejoie like it's a shit show but through all that People say Leafs, you know, it, it's it, it comes from Leafs Nation, really. And, and that's what it, uh, other people online really feed from. Leafs fans say this team has no grit, no heart, they're soft. Blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, through all of the adversity, they're in a playoff spot. They're playing well. Look at what they just did with a very depleted lineup against St. Louis. When they rise to the occasion, they don't get props for, hey, you know, the Leafs actually dug in on a tough night, and they won. They played well. No. It's, of course, the Leafs are going to win with everybody out. It's so typical Leafs. So winning without your star players is typical. Losing is typical. Being soft is typical. But getting suspended the most in the NHL since Perils took over in NHL player safety is also typical. All these things, Leaf fans, the first thing they do when they come online is the Leafs lost, so typical. Ingvall scored a goal, so typical revenge night. It's like the Leafs have been around for 107 years. There's a lot of players around the NHL that have wore a Leafs jersey at one point or another. It's not that, oh, this guy who used to play for the Leafs came back and scored. It's the, it, because, of, because they've been around for so long, because they spend so much money and there's so much player turnover in this town, pretty much 8 to 10 free agents a year every off season. Yeah, there's a lot of turnover, so there's a lot of ex-Leafs all over the NHL. But it's, oh, um... Bunting's back in town. Very typical. He's going to score. Inval's back in town. Very typical. He's going to score. Rasmus Sandin back in town. Very typical. Everything is typical for Leaf fans. It's typical that they win. It's typical that they lose. It's typical that they're soft. It's typical that they're the most suspended. It's typical that, you know, X players score. Meanwhile, Matthews is on pace for 71. Typical Matthews on pace for 71. There, There is... There, there is no, like, context around anything. Everything is just typical. Oh, it's typical. Typical Leafs. I don't want... Uh, what, typical what? Like, 
there has to be some context around what's happening. Right? The Tampa Bay Lightning suck. The Leafs are better than the Sydney Crosby Pittsburgh Penguins. The Leafs are better than the Ovi led Washington Capitals. The Leafs are better than the Tampa Bay Lightning. Through everything that they've gone through this season, they've rised above it, and, and yet everything is typical. Typical losers, typical soft, typical suspended. Ty everything is typical, but yet they they keep rising to the occasion. They keep facing adversity. They keep running through it, and it's a testament to how good their top guys are because nobody else is scoring on the Leafs, and yet the Leafs are still winning games. The Leafs are still in a playoff spot, and they're winning games. And it's not because of, it's it's not because of Max Domi, not because of Tyler Bertuzzi. It's definitely not because of Jake McCabe. It's definitely not because of Benoit, who who together, you know, they're carving out a niche for themselves. That game where Mason Mason Marchman was running around, and McCabe got super pissed. Benoit backed them up because you know they're starting to form chemistry. But unfortunately, that defense pair coughs up the puck at least two or three times in key situations every game. The Leafs' defense is atrocious. Right? We expect the goaltender to build the Leafs out. Meanwhile, there is no team defense. Like There is no structure to the Leafs. They're winging it every single night. The Sheldon Keefe can't do nothing. A good coach would have figured something out, but not Sheldon Keefe. Sheldon Keefe does the same thing over and over again. Right? You saw versus St. Louis, um, Bertuzzi, Domi, and Robertson looked like a pretty good line. Guess what's going to happen when everybody else comes back in the lineup? That lineup, that line is going to get broken up. Why? Any other coach with any common sense would be like, okay, so that's the third line. Camp is on the fourth line. Nyes is going to play on one of the top two lines. And, you know, you figure out who plays um, that final left wing on uh, on the line that Nyes isn't. Bertuzzi shouldn't be on one of the top two lines. But it makes sense when you see that line and how good they were versus St. Louis. They were in on the four check. They were, all three players have speed. All three players play with tenacity. And like they were creating turnovers. It, it, it was one of it was probably one of uh, Bertuzzi's best games. This guy's never going to score a goal again. I'll tell you that right. Now. <laughs> like I don't know what this guy's problem is. At five and a half million dollars, he better score. He better start scoring. I keep him on the third line until he starts scoring. And then you see Nick Robertson has one of his best games. Uh, Domi had a really good game. And you see them on the, you know, no Tavares, no Marner. All of a sudden you see Domi and Bertuzzi on the number one power play. And the number one power play looked way different, but it, it was good. You got Bertuzzi and Domi. Matthews behind the net gives it to Bertuzzi. He snaps it to Domi and, you know, it bounced off of his skate a little hard and he couldn't snap it in. But he got the shot off and it hit the goalie in the pad, but. All of a sudden, that power play, totally different dynamic, looked pretty good. You know, if I'm Sheldon Keefe, I say, okay, you know, I don't need to play my top guys so many minutes. Distribute the minutes more to everybody else. Let them feel a part of the game. Let them feel a part of the team. And maybe they start contributing more. Because right now, it feels like the bottom six guys don't feel like they're really part of the team. And at any time there's an extra minute, an extra shift, and an extra whatever, it's going to the top guys because, you know, Nylander's killing power plays now. Matthews is killing power plays. And Marner's killing power play, uh, uh, power plays. So it's, you know, the bottom six guys can't even get out there in a penalty-killing role. And, and if the Leafs start taking penalties and they get called for everything under the moon, you know, the Leafs can't touch a guy without getting a penalty. The bottom six guys are stapled to the bench. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's five on five again, and the Leafs are trying to score off the rush and be a, you know, high-flying team. 
And then the top two lines, you know, start rolling out there, and then the bottom six guys are on the bench still. So it's, you know, you can't you can't have guys like Bertuzzi and Domi and Robertson all like eight, nine, ten, eleven minutes a night. They need to play at least 13, 14, 15 minutes. It doesn't make any sense for them not to play. Like, you know, it, it seems like you got two fourth lines and then two top lines. That's what it, that's what it seems like. And it just it, once you start sharing the minutes a little bit better. Everyone feels like they're a part of the situation. And then all of a sudden, McMahon scores a hat trick. Where's, where's that supplemental scoring been all year? Let the guys get out on the ice a little bit more, and maybe they'll contribute. You know, you can't put Domi out there eight, you know, 10, 11 minutes a night and expect him to do whatever. Now, he's going out at every third shift or something like that. It's You, you don't feel involved. Sheldon Keefe's got to figure this out, man. He's he's been the coach for way too long of this team for him to not know what his lineup is and how to best utilize it. You've been here way too long. Figure it out before the playoffs, or I I swear to God, I'm going to start a campaign myself to get this guy fired. It's embarrassing to be an NHL coach and to coach the same players for this long and not know who to put out in what situation and what their ice time should be. You have these guys strapped with things that are, you know, uh, modules that are recording their speed, how much they're skating, what their output is. You have all this advanced data and you can't figure out what the optimal amount of time on the ice for Matthews is. If you have to play Matthews and Marner and Nylander 24 minutes a night to win games, you're creating that situation because nobody else feels like they're a part of the team. Nobody else is scoring because, you know, what's Max Domi supposed to do in 11 minutes? What's McMahon supposed to do in 11 minutes? All of a sudden, their time got elevated. They were on the ice. They were part of the situation more. Guess what? They generated offense. It, it, it's not rocket science to be a coach in the NHL. You know, these guys just get recycled. You know, if, if, if Laviolette gets fired in Carolina, he gets hired in New York. You know, the guy didn't change. His coaching philosophy didn't change. If it didn't work in one place, it might work for a little bit in a new place because for some reason, when you change the coach, NHL players get this, like, you know, this boost. But that boost fades every single time, right? In a long-distance race... Having nitrous in your car doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it boosts your speed for a little bit, but once your nitrous is gone, if you, if you can't keep up, you're going to lose the race. Right? So, it's... Um, me, personally, I'm very optimistic about the Leafs. Through everything that they've gone through, through the mishmash of defense that they've had to play, you know, Giordano's been hurt, Jan Kruk got hurt, you know, like, Wolves been hurt forever. They've gone through it all. And they're still in the playoff spot. And they're still playing better than a lot of teams that people think are better than the Leafs. Tampa Bay, Pittsburgh. You know, look at the West. The West is garbage. There's a few teams at the top, like Vegas. Like, uh, LA totally fell off. Um, it, it, like, when you look at the standings... In the West, the West is garbage. If the Leafs were in the West, they'd run the West. But you got, you know, you got Ve you got the Canucks, you got Vegas, you got Dallas, uh, you got Colorado, who's very shaky as well. And then that's it, right? It's like, it's like four or five teams, and, and, you know, everybody in Edmonton is so excited about their run. If I had to play Chicago, Arizona, Minnesota, Nashville on a weekly basis, the Leafs would have a much better a record, right? You got Seattle, Anaheim, San Jose. You got Minnesota, Arizona, Chicago. Those are six teams that, like, barely, like, four of the teams that I just named, so Chicago, San Jose, Anaheim, haven't even hit 20 wins yet. They're at 14, 15. Like, the Western Conference is garbage. The East is much better, right? You got New York. You got Carolina. You got Florida. 
you got uh, Boston, and then you got some teams that could very easily get hot. Like Pittsburgh could easily get hot and win five, six, seven in a row. Tampa can be very easily, if Vasilevsky figures it out, win five, six, seven in a row. Right? There is no such thing. Like if you if you look at let's look at the wild card. The wild card in the West. Wow, Los Angeles really fell off. So it's Los Angeles, St. Louis, Nashville. Nashville is close is is tied actually with Los Angeles and St. Louis. No, Nashville is two points behind. So fifty-eight points gets you a wild card spot. Meanwhile, you know, the Leafs are in the, technically in a wild card spot with 62 points, but they have three games on Tampa. Right? Three games, six points, you're at 68. Florida's at 72, right? So, I just, I'm very optimistic about where the Leafs are. I think it's definitely Samsonov is back. He's playing good old-fashioned, regular NHL caliber goal, uh, goalie. And it's going to carry the Leafs for the rest of the season. Hopefully, Wall gets back and the Leafs have a, a you know like a capable backup that, that could take some games away from Sammy. And then I think, you know, come the trade deadline, I don't think the Leafs are going to do much. They may just, you know, I think they, they might make one or two minor moves for depth on defense and on forward. Just because I don't, I don't think they're going to go into the playoffs with Holmberg, McMahon, and Robertson on the playoff lineup, right? Like, you can't go into the playoffs with guys like Lagesson or whatever. Like, they need to add depth. It's going to be minor moves. But, um, you know, they def definitely have to do something. But, you know, as a Leaf fan, I don't have to worry about the Leafs making the playoffs. But other teams have to worry about their team just being in NHL like Ottawa Senators are spent have spent to the cap and they're garbage. Stutzler's garbage, Batherson is garbage, you know, all, all the all the the guy that got, you know, investigated for online gambling, like trash. They spend that money on Corpus Allo. The guy's never carried an NHL team in his entire life. I don't know what they thought how why they thought that this guy was going to carry the Ottawa Center just to a playoff spot, but it's, you know, it is what it is. Be happy. Uh, if you're a Leafs fan, your team is showing heart, grit, and determination by going through all of these obstacles, and hopefully, come trade deadline, they're going to get healthy, and they're going to make a, uh, they're going to, you know, build towards the playoffs. And guys like Bertuzzi and Domi are really going to earn their money in the playoffs. And they're going to look like a totally different team than what you're used to in the playoffs. Trust me when I tell you that. And, and that's a good thing. That to me, knowing that the Leafs are going to be a different team in the playoffs from previous years when they've had Engvall and uh, Kerfoot and guys like that. Like they're, they're good players. But they're not playoff type players where, you know, Bertuzzi is way more physical on the four check and he's he's way better at creating turnovers and Max Domi is the same thing. And I think the more guys like Nick Robertson and McMahon and all these guys spend more time around Reeves, Domi, Bertuzzi, and they see how hard they play, I think it rubs off on them. And you saw that in the last game. Like the way Robertson was hunting pucks, back checking with speed and tenacity and with, with a purpose. I, I just, that's what I like to see. Like, everybody knows Nick Robertson can put the puck in the net. Everybody knows he's an NHL caliber player. But can he do the other stuff like the way Nye did in the playoffs last year versus Tampa, where you can put him out on the ice and not have to worry about him being a liability because Nyes was very sound uh, playing with Tavares, right? He was making the the right plays. He was 
holding on to pucks. He wasn't throwing them away. You know, that play he makes on the boards to Tavares for that series clinching goal. You know, it, it it's a small thing, but it's hockey fundamentals. And uh, yeah, I, I'm actually very interested to see what this team is gonna, how this team is gonna play come the playoffs. It's it's definitely gonna be different than anything we've seen before. And you know, the top guys are doing what the top guys do. Matthews on pace for big points, big goals. Um, Marner, Nylander, and all of a sudden. Everybody was writing Tavares off, and boom, he scores three goals in three games. And where where are all those people? Right. Oh, Tavares is done. Tavares is old. Tavares can't score anymore. Boom, he scores three goals in three games. Let not write off franchise number one overall picks. You know, guys that are easily going into the Hall of Fame, right? Tavares is top five in goals and points from his draft class. Point a game player. All of a sudden, everybody wants to write him off because that's what we do in Toronto. Everyone is the when it comes to the Leafs, everyone is crap. Everyone should be traded. Everyone should be fired. Meanwhile, if Tavares was on, you know, the Pittsburgh Penguins and they were making a drive to the playoffs and made the playoffs and made some noise, they'd be like, man. We we wish we had a player like Tavares. That's the way. How, that's the way usually it goes in Toronto. But anyways, um, I can't believe we're a couple of weeks away from March. Things are flying by. Uh so yeah, I appreciate it. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um. I love interacting with you guys and um, definitely like and subscribe or comment. If you have, you know, suggestions, we're going to do something before the trade deadline first week of March um, to get ready for the trade deadline. Uh, we're going to talk about some rumors that are out there, um, what the Leafs possibly could do. You guys let me know what you, the players you'd like to see the Leafs acquire. If you guys hear any rumors out there, pop them into the comments. We'll tally them all up, and then we'll talk about it later. Okay, everybody. Enjoy your Thursday. Leafs versus Flyers tonight. Flyers are going down. Sorry. Okay, everybody. Enjoy your week. Enjoy your evening. Enjoy the Leafs game tonight. We'll talk next week.